Today's panel is on southbound interface for programmable data plane. And uh, we have some technologies here. Uh, just to get an, uh, an idea, I just want to know if anybody, everybody knows about these technologies on the slides. Have you heard of them? Have you, do you know in depth of what's going, that, what they are? So the panelists get an idea of how in depth they should go. So can I get a hand maybe to see how many of you know all of them? And uh, so not many people. So we could go a little bit in detail about them. Um, the main focus about this panel is to get an idea about the programmable data pane and also an advice for the ODL community, how to go forward in this domain. So to introduce my panelists, I have Michael uh, Zayetz from HPE. He is the uh, distinguished uh, technologist and architect of OpenSwitch. He'll talk a little bit about OpenSwitch in a while, in, in, a, in a minute. And then we have Prem from Barefoot Networks. He's a product line manager, and he leads uh, at different projects in P4 Consortium. And uh, then we have Dr. Hayu Song, who is the <coughs> chief architect at, at Huawei and has led the protocol ob oblivious forwarding, which is the POF um, technology. And then finally, we have Yon, which is who is the distinguished engineer at Cisco and is also an, uh, uh, the uh, engineer of the, ODL, of the ODL technical steering community and also of FIDO, which we'll be talking in a, in a minute. So, and I am Anu, I'm a systems engineer at uh, HPE. Uh, so we will probably go very quickly into the panel. So in today's panel, we have some key points that we want to achieve. One is to introduce these te technologies to you all to find out what, we, what is a programmable data plane. And after that, we'll go into a, a deep down discussion about it. So please feel free to ask any questions at any point of time. We'll take audience questions. And if not, I have some questions prepared too. So we can get the uh, panel to give us some ideas from their expertise and experience. And one of the important thing is integration to the SDN control plane. So data plane goes to the next layer. And if it's programmable, how do you integrate it with the control plane? And finally, some use cases in general. So I have the different technologies here. I'm going to go ahead and ask my panel to introduce them to us. So Jan, you want to go forward? You can use the pointer. And do you have a mic? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, okay, perfect. Yeah, so I'll be I'll be talking a little bit about Fido. Uh, .io. Who has heard about FIDO so far? Almost everybody in the room, great. So it's a new initiative in Linux Foundation, and it is um, designed to um, further the evolution of programmable networking. Um, we have the dynamicism and uh, the programmability and uh, kind of flexibility happening in SDN, in cloud, in NFV, but um, one of the big un un unsolved problems is how to deliver network services in this more dynamic environment. Um, some attention has been focused on the um, non-local control plane, on controllers. I mean, they have kind of um, uh, cornered all the um, limelight of uh, the community, but uh, the humble forwarding elements, they, they haven't really. There hasn't been a lot of work uh, apart from OVS. So, you know, this is a new initiative that's uh, aimed at addressing that. So what we need to really do is add dynamic data plane services. So um, the limitations of the existing data planes is um, performance, scalability, and stability. We all know about them. Uh, it's overly complex architectures, which are hard to evolve. Uh, there's also the complex architectures mean that we have slow rate of innovation and a steep learning curve for developers who want to work on that. Um, it's hard to deploy, and we also, because it's hard to deploy, there is lack of end-to-end uh, -end system testing and uh, support and portability. Uh, and uh, also, uh, sometimes the architectures or the new advances in processor architectures are not being taken advantage of. 
So what is FDIO? It's a new project in Linux Foundation. It's multi-party, multi-project. What does multi-party mean? It means anybody can join, and you're more than welcome to come and start contributing, either as a company or as an individual. Uh, what does multi-project mean? There is multiple projects. One is, for example, really the one that's developing core of the uh, uh, FDIO, FIDO technology, uh, the VPP. Uh, the other, for example, is the networking agent, Honeycomb. Some of, them, some of you may have heard about that too. Uh, there's um, anybody can propose a new project um, so if you have some great ideas about new uh, forwarding ways or doing forwarding or new protocol types or what have you uh, it's a great way how to park them where to park them where to where to do development on them so what does it mean uh, this is the stack this is basically uh, what it's all about it's about IO um, input output uh, which matches uh, or pushes packets between cores in a CPU and um, the I.O. Uh, units. It's processing. Uh, it's a so-called VPP engine, vector pro uh, packet engine. Uh, and then there's the management agent, um, which is basically uh, a netconf agent that uh, provides control uh, for uh, the other layers. Vector passes processing, that's really the cool technology around which all this, this project is built around. Um, it runs on commodity x86 CPUs, leverages DPDK. Uh, it's basically a vector engine. It uh, creates a vector of packet indices and processes them using a directed graph of nodes. Uh, there's going to be a detailed presentation of the technology by Ed Warnicking uh, later in a week, so I would uh, encourage you to go and attend that. Uh, it's basically a Linux user space application. That's really cool and really important here to know. Um, and ships part as bo both embedded and server products, and it ships in volume. And it's been actual in development since 2002, so that technology is quite mature. It's been only recently open source, but the technology is mature. When we look uh, at VPP in the overall stack, you can actually see where it sits. It's in the data plane services along with DP, DPDK. And we've got operating systems, controller orchestration, VM management systems, and so forth. Now, one really interesting thing, since this panel is talking about uh, the API between the controllers and the data plane services, um, you actually see open daylight in this picture twice, in this picture. Uh, it's a network controller, but also the agent is based on open daylight, the Honeycomb agent, and it's basically a really fast and high-performing netconf agent on the northbound. And uh, the API between the controller, the preferred API between the controller and the uh, VPP-based forward is actually netconf. Probably will go with the POF. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today I'm going to give you a very brief introduction of uh, protocol oblivious forwarding. Um, POF uh, actually started as an internal research project within Huawei uh, more than three years ago. At that time, most of the research actually focused more on the manage management plane and the control plane. But we were thinking the more fundamental issues, how we will involve the data plane to make it a better uh, suit for uh, SDN's requirement. So the main issue we found on the current network is that uh, uh, network device, uh, just a fixed function box, is very hard for service providers to uh, add uh, customer functions or to uh, modify its behaviors at the runtime. Um, so therefore, we have this vision of the open programmable data plane. Um, so the key idea is we just open up the programmability of the network device and really hand this kind of flexibility to the service provider to allow them to customize their data plane. Um, after we uh, uh, announced this idea and uh, actually um, gave our first uh, public demo uh, in three years, uh, more than three years ago, uh, there are some uh, related industry activities actually keep, uh, keeping uh, validate this, uh, uh, this idea. 
So the first noticeable one is uh, probably the OCP networking project. So the key idea is to decouple the networking operating uh, system and the device. So by doing this, it actually provides an ab abstract uh, switch interface, then allow you the user to write just one single program. Then they, it can be applied to heterogeneous uh, uh, data plane. Unfortunately, this architecture is still based on the fixed function ASICs which means uh, uh, the user will have very little uh, flexibility to modify the folding plane behavior. It can just uh, to do some uh, configuration and uh, maybe manipulate some of the flow tables. So very little flexibility. So therefore, we actually move to the second stage. The second stage is uh, embodied by the uh, programmable chips and the, some high-level languages which we can use to uh, program the, the underlying device. So this actually allow the first time allow the user to customize their network behaviors. And also now you have one device, D depending on what kind of software you installed uh, to the device, you can really incarnate the, uh, the device to different type of uh, uh, forms. Uh, for example, it can be a router switch or even a firewall or, or net gateway anything uh, you can imagine. But well, actually the POPS vision can is stretch this uh, a little bit further because we consider the network can be, can be very dynamic. Some applications really need the real time and undermined modification of the data plane. Therefore the POPS actually uh, uh, supports some, the interactive programming, uh, which means we can really uh, modify the network behavior and uh, runtime. So to, to realize this, you can see the POF architecture uh, uh, has this uh, uh, thin waste uh, architecture. So the waste is actually the standard uh, intermediate, in, uh, intermediate representation and a standard um, interface we use to configure the device and also uh, run the runtime control. Um, so there are three key defining uh, properties of POF uh, is that it's language independent, which means we can use different type of high-level language to program them, as long as, long as this, all this language can be compiled to the standard IR. And also it's a protocol independent, which means user can freely design their own uh, runtime protocols uh, running on the following plane. And the last is the target dependent, which means um, uh, the, 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 the forwarding plane actually can be built with different type of chips. Either it's MPU, CPU, uh, programmable chips, FPG. Uh, uh, they, they just need to comply with uh, uh, this uh, standard source bound interface to be able to communicate with uh, uh, upper layers. So more, uh, and the last point is, uh, uh, since you have a, a single uh, source bound interface to support both the configuration time and the runtime, it really supports this uh, interactive, uh, interactive programming for real time and on demand applications. So the architecture is very simple. The folding plane uh, abstraction just based on this uh, uh, table action pipelines and with very simple attached to the input port and output port. The main programming point is this action. Action can be uh, use or we define a set of instructions and we use this uh, set of instructions to program this uh, custom ac action. And these actions can be dynamically loaded to the data plane. And for the tables, there's uh, basically each uh, flow entries can use some pointer to point to a different uh, custom action. So therefore, um, we can dynamically change it at runtime. And also there are some dynamic shared resources uh, which can be addressed from, from each uh, custom action. But with this mechanism, we can easily support the state for data pass processing. So we have made a, very, uh, a lot of progress since we introduced uh, POC. Right now, we already have this NE40E-based full-stack POC, which means we, now we can support uh, language like P4. And we have the southbound interface, which is uh, basically the extension of the open flow and we have the hardware-based uh, platform. And uh, we also actively work in the ONF uh, uh, in, to work on the next gen uh, of the OpenFlow specification. Um, in uh, this uh, uh, ONS, we will uh, showcase uh, one killer application, 
which can take advantage of the POF's capability. We call that dynamic net network probes. Um, and the next step, we are thinking about how to integrate POF into the mainstream SDN controllers, such as uh, ODL. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Prem Janalagadda. I'm a product line manager at uh, Barefoot Networks. I also moonlight as a community manager at uh, P4.org. I'd like to give you a brief introduction of P4. Um, P4, as you can see, stands for Programming Protocol Independent Packet Processors. So let me start with uh, a bunch of questions. Today, how can you quickly deploy new protocols in your network? How can you see what your forwarding plane is doing? How do you own that forwarding plane and the intellectual property that's in it? How do you tailor the network to meet your needs? And how do you write code that, go in, that goes into your forwarding plane that can be portable across multiple devices? Today, the answer to these questions is, uh, you know, it's um, very difficult or not possible um, in some scenarios. So what do we need? What do we need to be able to essentially get ownership of the forwarding plane and the IP that is in it? We need a couple of things. One, we need programmable switch chips or programmable forwarding plane. And then you need... Uh, It'll be good to have an industry-wide programming language that can program or specify the behavior of these uh, forwarding planes. So that's where P4 comes in. So let's see what P4 is. P4 is a programming language. Um, if you don't take anything away from this uh, presentation, take that away. It's a programming language. It's not only a programming language, but it's a high-level programming language meaning it's easier for software engineers to you know, read and code in this language. Um, another interesting thing is it's networking domain specific. Um, it's not a you know, compute specific language or you know, some other type of target. It's networking domain specific. So it operates on an abstract forwarding model that is geared towards networking. So it makes it very easy to specify networking behavior or networking uh, features in this language. And then this language doesn't really know any protocols. So it's protocol agnostic or protocol independent, meaning you can define uh, the protocol in this language. Uh, the language inherently doesn't know any pro uh, protocols. And last but not the least, uh, P4 has been around for a few years. That's Gaining adoption and also the ecosystem around P4 is growing quite rapidly. So P4 and OpenFlow are kind of talked about interchangeably or you know one is the replacement for another. So just wanted to clarify that a little bit. You know, if you can see this picture, um, P4 is playing on the on the side over there, uh, a developer or a networking software engineer writes a P4 program that describes the forwarding plane. He compiles that program, generates a binary or configuration that goes into a target, and then the compiler also generates API to control that pipeline. So it all resides in the forwarding plane. Now, how do you access that forwarding plane? You can do it through traditional driver and you know, um, protocol stacks. Or you can use OpenFlow. I mean, OpenFlow, you would use an OpenFlow controller like Open Daylight or others. Use the OpenFlow protocol to talk to an OpenFlow agent that is sitting on top of a, a driver that's controlling the P4 pipeline. So that's the distinction between uh, P4 and OpenFlow. Now, the P4 program itself and compiling it and downloading it can be folded into the controller side of things. Um, that is something. That'll be good for the ODL community to look at. Um, there are people looking at it, but it's a possibility. 
Uh, it's something for the future. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the P4 Language Consortium itself. Uh, this consortium exists to create um, an open source community around this language. Um, it's um, and also working on evolution of this language, you know, different versions, adding new features. Uh, a lot of the companies that are here are members of the p4.org. Uh, membership is free. Uh, everything is open source. All you need to do is uh, sign uh, Apache 2.0 CLA to join uh, the website and the GitHub links are over there. Uh, just to kind of give you a snapshot of uh, current members, there are about 40 organizations from industry and academia, about 34 from the industry, six from academia. And it's, I mean, everybody in the networking industry is represented here. Um, cloud service providers to software vendors. Uh, everybody that wants to get control of the data plane um, or forwarding plane are here. Uh, some of the links here just showing you there's resources. It's kind of hard to read, but you know, maybe when you get a copy of the slides, you can go look at it. Uh, there's a compiler, there's a spec, there's a full function L2, L3 switch pipeline, open sourced. You can also use a, a packet test framework to test your, your pipeline if you want. So now, if you have all of this, what can you do? There's a bunch of things I added here, but essentially it gives you ownership of the forwarding pipeline. It gives you ownership of the IP that's in the pipeline. You can keep your IP from going to your competitors. Um, and uh, you can modify your network uh, whenever you want. Um, essentially, it gives, it gives the control into the end user and helps networks be designed top down rather than bottom up. Um, what do you do now? I mean, there are ways to get involved. Join p4.org. Um, try out the software that's already out there on GitHub. Um, you can also join us in upcoming events. There's uh, actually an open switch uh, booth um, at ONS where we'll be demonstrating a P4 pipeline uh, switch, soft switch, controlled by open switch. There's also um, P4 workshop coming up. Finally, join the mailing list. That's where all the information gets uh, disseminated. Uh, thanks. Yep. Are we taking questions? Yeah. No, no, no. Go ahead. Yeah, I will. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I think I kind of addressed that. I mean, if we go back. Um, Oh, sorry. So what's the, the question was, what is the need of P4 in the presence of OpenFlow, right? I mean, OpenFlow gives you access to a pipeline, right? Um, so if you see most fixed function ASICs, they have a level of abstraction using TTP, and then you get access to that abstraction using OpenFlow, correct? But P4 allows you to change the underlying layer. So, for example, if you have a device that does protocol A and B, you can access those protocols using OpenFlow, but you cannot implement protocol C, right? So what really confuses me is the forwarding plane that you have. <coughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So is it like forwarding plane, are you talking about the code switching and open code switching? That's a good question. So the forwarding plane there can be a soft switch, or so sorry. The question is, what is that uh, a forwarding plane in this picture? Um, uh, is it like a what did you say? So like open flow switch. Open switch. switch. Correct. Right. So the, the the forwarding. What is the forwarding plane? So it can be uh, a soft switch, an open flow switch. It can be a completely traditional L2 L3 switch that you write using. P4 program, uh, it could be, uh, let's say there's a P4 programmable chip. It could be that, that just takes a P4 program and runs it, right? But does the output coming out of your compiler is gonna be different for each type of solution? The question was, does the output coming out of the compiler be different for each solution? And the answer is yes, yeah. So there's a front-end compiler um, that kind of uh, gets you to compile the P4 program, generate an intermediate representation then you can map that to a backend compiler to any target you want. There's a few backend compilers already out there, mapped to FPGAs, NPUs, 
uh, even GPUs, somebody mapped a P4 program to a GPU to do flow tracking and things like that. So, yeah. Thank you. And finally, open. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Michael Zayetz, and I work for HPE, and I'm the architect of OpenSwitch project. So Clem just mentioned um, OpenSwitch and how OpenSwitch works with P4, so I will give you a little bit more overview about what the project itself is about. So we started this project about, we launched the project about six, seven months ago, and the objective of this project is to create a fully open source and community-driven operating system for the switches. So we are not talking about virtual switches, we are talking about physical switches. And we want to create, basically fill the gap of not having completely available and free operating system for those devices. So we're talking, so if you want to think about, you know, parallels, it's more similar to like Cisco Nexus OS, Arista OS, these kind of systems. Um, we don't want to develop just a system that will support only just OpenFlow. It's the traditional operating system with layer two features, layer three features, everything, and OpenFlow, of course. Um, the configuration is available through different protocols, the northbound interface. There are many different uh, northbound interfaces, and we'll talk a little bit more about OVSDB as we get to it because it's, uh, there is some relationship to Open Virtual Switch. So, First of all, what's important for me to stress out is the fact that we are building a community. So right now we have a um, very active mailing list, RC channels, people contribute code and work together and everything is Apache 2.0 and stuff like that. So if you can see, here you can see all the companies that actually work together with us, all the ASIC vendors actually work on developing drivers for the system. Um, this slide, well, it's very difficult to see anything on this slide. But on this slide, generally, I spend like 30, 40 minutes. And whoever is more interested can actually visit our booth uh, tomorrow and uh, on Wednesday. And we will also host some session tomorrow as well to go deeper into this one. But what is more important is to understand that Open, virtu open Switch is very much based on Open Virtual Switch. So we grab many, many of the architectural pieces out of Virtual Switch. So we have open OVSDB server in the middle of the system. That's very much a state database driven system. And this is the main kind of control interface, management interface for the system. We also have all the different layers, all the different plugin layers at this place that allow us to connect to different uh, ASICs, to provide different drivers. And one of them is, for example, P4. So right now we have we are running on physical switches, not on virtual switches, but we also have the target which creates OVA and creates Docker containers, and we can actually, we actually test this way and we um, create platform-dependent pieces this way. So we have P4 integrated, so we can, uh, we can support, we can run on top of uh, P4 data planes. And since we're based on open virtual switch, then we have OVS agent. So we have OpenFlow built in. So right now Broadcom actually attaches the, create, contributes the support for OpenFlow in OpenSwitch open nacelle drivers. Um, current status, we are getting very feature rich. We are getting all the different features. OpenFlow is being added by Broadcom, as I said. We are getting P4 support. Um, we have Broadcom drivers, we have Barefoot drivers with P4, we have Cavium drivers, Mellanox actually already announced that they have, they build the side drivers for us. Um, and some additional ASIC driver, ASIC vendors are coming in. Um, and we actually target to have some first stable release in about June, July timeframe. Okay, thank you. All right, so now that we have all the uh, concepts in place, the next thing we want to go into is the, the questions, right? So um, after the panel proposal was accepted and the panel was decided, it took me some time to figure out how do we put all these things together. So we have uh, FIDO, we have OpenSwitch, we have P4, POF, right? So 
Uh, OpenSwitch is a network operating system. O uh, FIDO is fast data performance. You have P4 and POPOF, which are compilers, right? language compilers in the switch. So uh, taking the concept of ODL in place, because this is an ODL mini sub summit, and all our data plane programmer, programmable uh, uh, te technologies are actually controller agnostic. So I want to drive this panel in such a way that we get uh, an idea of why do we need data programmable data plane, and also what is the direction for ODL. Uh, so in, let me just start off with a question to the panel asking, uh, why do you think from your perspective or from the projects oops, sorry, uh, from the from the projects that uh, you have given to the community uh, what is the reason that we need a programmable data plane uh, why do you see that there, there's a need for it uh, as I as I said in my presentation I mean we need the flexibility mm -hmm. and the uh, um, speed of feature delivery and the dynamic nature that we see in the upper layers uh, of the stack in the applications, in uh, SDN, in uh, um, uh, NFV control plan, if you will, uh, we need the same flexibility and the same um, uh, feature velocity in um, uh, the forwarding elements themselves. That's, that's a very simple reason. Uh, I'd like to approach this uh, uh, question from the service provider's uh, perspective. Uh, service, service provider has uh, uh, two key requirements. The first one is to, to reduce their um, system cost. I think this uh, open data plane actually, uh, so first the key point is uh, decouple the, uh, the, the control plane, the forwarding plane, uh, and really uh, enable the um, kind of uh, 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 a wide, can help a service provider to avoid the vendor locking issues and provide an open ecosystem. And secondly, you have a um, fully customized application, uh, you, uh, so it's totally um, uh, user controlled. So uh, for the same hardware device, you can install different uh, uh, enabling uh, softwares that will um, uh, extend the product's life cycle. And uh, also um, you can, um, uh, have fully uh, customized uh, applications um, is actually you can dedicate the entire resource for the single uh, application that uh, uh, on the other hand it can help uh, uh, you uh, improve the efficiency and uh, um, lower your system cost. And another requirement is uh, to generate the new revenue and since uh, uh, now the really the user control the programmability you can, uh, the service provider can have, have its own secret sauce and ha have its own differential services. They no longer need to rely on the vendor to provide it to them. They also don't need to reveal this uh, application to others and, and through the software means they can uh, deploy the, the, the application, the service uh, uh, much faster. So it shorten the time to market. So it's uh, another way to uh, increase their revenue. Yeah, I uh, echo Haru's uh, thoughts on this. I think um, programmability has existed in compute for years, and networking is actually late to the game. Um, and networks these days are growing fast. The demands on the networks are changing rapidly. And uh, if you really don't have control on the forwarding plane, you don't adapt to the changing needs fast enough. So programmability is uh, essential in, in networks of today to be able to change fast, adapt to the needs, and uh, you know, basically build better networks. I will try to go a little bit into the use cases that we hear a lot from the customers, and that's more about the way of getting, gaining more visibility and monitoring capabilities into the networks. And it gets us all together into this programmability stuff because in order to get this visibility, understand what happens, and then take it, close the loop and, get, and, and actually act based on this understanding, we need a way to actually affect the traffic in a very dynamic way, in the way that the system 
um, that should allow the applications to actually come in and, and redirect the traffic. So if we understand that, okay, this is the application and this is what happens in a very dynamic situation, we need the ability to actually reprogram the network very, very rapidly. So visibility is now key for the customers and the, the ability to close the, to close the gap, to close the loop and affect the traffic based on this visibility is very key as well. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so do ha the audience have any questions? Yes, so this looks like a possible replacement for custom vendor ASICs and line cards to allow customization of the program uh, of the boarding plane. Um, what do you think the, at least the initial performance of these things would be if you're dealing with line cards that are working on 100 gigabit or 10 gigabit speeds? Is it realistic to think that some of this stuff is capable of operating at those speeds? Uh, just to rephrase the, I mean, just to repeat the question for the online uh, recording. So, for uh, line rate, uh, for uh, line cards which have really high data rate, how is the performance we can see with the programmable data plane? If that's what yes, and, and is this targeted at replacing some of those vendor-specific ASICs? and targeting replacing vendor specific ASICs. Okay, cool. <laughs> so I can try and answer it a little bit. Um, there will always be some restrictions on the flexibilities inside the ASICs. ASICs will never be completely 100% flexible as the software data passes. However, we already see the first batches of flexible ASICs uh, that are in production or very close to production that provide same performance as the classic ASIC, like classic ASICs, and provide almost full flexibility. So we, we, we see them in production, some companies, and some companies are preparing them very soon. Yeah, we have some experience on uh, building this uh, prototype. Our prototype is based on the network processor. So the first gen of pro prototype is on 40 gig um, MPs, and the second gen is on the 200 gig MPs. So we did see some performance loss due to the compiler inefficiency, but uh, pretty close. So we are keep working on the on compiling technologies and making the performance close to the line speed processing. So uh, what you see with VPP is near line card or near dedicated hardware performance. I mean, something that was uh, in dedicated hardware a couple of years ago is now achievable on general purpose CPUs. So uh, VPP gets about 40 million packet per second out of a single core today. So that's, that's, that's significant performance, and as the cores or the number of cores in a given CPU goes up, uh, the performance will, uh, will go up. So we will see uh, in the near future what today's like high-end line cards could be replaced by general purpose uh, compute uh, hardware in the future with this technology. You want to yeah, yeah, I just want to add something. Um, so you asked about performance and programmability, right? So achieving performance with programmability has been hard. Uh, but if you look at uh, the merchant silicon today, um, that's uh, the top of the line. You have one that is, uh, you know, not that flexible, and we have another one that is completely flexible. So it's already been shown that you can achieve performance with flexibility and programmability. Yes, uh, you had a question. I'll, I'll probably come back to you. Sure. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So you guys are discussing, you have, you have POS, you have P4, there's other programmable languages out there, NetA, and a couple others. So it's sort of like a fracturing of this ecosystem here. How do you see these kind of coalescing, you know, or, or we look at a, like a VHS versus Betamax format war, if you will, here between these different programmable architectures? So, what, do you, what do you see five years from now? Do you see any one clear, I don't want to say the winner, but um, you know, obviously everybody's going to go towards in one direction. Yeah, so the question was, uh, who is going to be the winner? That's a <laughs> question, a good question, because we have um, uh, different languages, and how do they coexist? So if I were to say the panel. <laughs> Well, that, that's an interesting question. It's like if um, VHS and Betamax was here and you were asking them who's going to win, <laughs> they both will say they'll win, right? Um, I, I think it's, uh, it's slightly different, though. I think 
Uh, today, what's happening is based on a particular need, um, there are things being done, and there is similarities between these things. There's a lot of overlap, but there's also differences. Um, so how will it be in the future? Uh, that depends on how, uh, you know, how the network needs are and you know, how the ecosystem builds around these technologies and a lot of uh, factors. But I think at a high level, what you're seeing is the need for more control in networks and, and visibility. I think Michael uh, you know, brought up a really good point, which is uh, you know, networks need visibility and um, you have choice of things that you, you, you can uh, use to achieve that, and you know, you, you, we don't know. <laughs> uh, you, you know, and, uh, in, at, at a certain level, who cares? I mean, you know, it will be decided by the marketplace and the communities that uh, these particular technologies will be able to attract. Uh, and uh, may the best community and the best technology win. Okay, so the question uh, was how, how do we uh, address the issue of multicast if, as, an as an example. And uh. So uh, actually in the, uh, we define just a very uh, abstract model and we do support multi-stage processing. And for the multicast, uh, the underlying mechanism is to just to replicate the packet to multiple ports. So with the existing uh, instructions, we can easily to support that. So uh, may I answer your question? No. Oh, okay. So. So on our uh, data, uh, data pass, actually, uh, there are uh, multiple um, uh, modules, right? The packet processing and the traffic manager. And so far, our focus is on the packet processing pipeline. So that part, uh, you can consider other modules like uh, virtual ports or uh, black box. But this part is all, uh, currently the programming point. So uh, since these um, engines are programmable, you can actually define your own stages, and that's what you do with VPP. You define like a graph, which the code then uh, um, goes uh, on, on, on the graph, and each basically node in a graph could be understood as a stage. So uh, I encourage you to attend Ed's presentation later in the week, uh, where he will go into details of the technology. But similar principles that you see in hardware can be found in these engines as well. Oh, Ed just joined the room. I was just talking about you. <laughs> so when's your presentation about FDIO? So FDIO, there's an FDIO intro at 410 on Wednesday. At 4.10 on Wednesday. And a meetup at 5 p.m. on Wednesday. Yep, so the, the presentation is in one of the grand ballrooms. The meetup is in Napa. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so much more fun than the other side. So, anybody else on the panel want to answer that question? Okay, so <coughs> Supposing it to be independent of each other, because not uh, I mean, each 
Yeah. So in OpenSwitch, what we do, we actually model them pretty much separately. So for example, underlay is going to be managed by BGP and other stuff, and overlay might be managed just by OpenFlow. So that's exactly the model that is being contributed right now by Broadcom into OpenSwitch. So underlay, because in many data centers, that's what they actually want. They want the underlay to be more of the traditional uh, routing protocols, and overlay to be completely, co completely programmable. So that's what we're going to do. Okay, any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm confused about this as well, Roger. Because most of the they are all uh, subclassed which is a mock. So, so I think uh, this project is uh, uh, used to replace the uh, open list switch. Right. Uh, <laughs> so the question is, are these projects to replace open V switch? Uh, the answer, I think it would be better that they give, but I think the answer is no. No, actually the answer is yes. The VPP and FDIO uh, <laughs> would be a replacement of Open vSwitch. And Open Switch is not supposed to replace it because we are basically running on the physical hardware. We are not running on the virtual switches. We have virtual option because for development, for testing, but not for the real deployments. Yeah, but but for uh, for POF, uh, I think uh, I mentioned in my slides is a uh, totally targeted independence, which means that it uh, uh, should work for both hardware and software-based platforms. Yeah, I think uh, similar for P4, right? Actually, yeah. Can you use P4 to define an open V switch-like pipeline? Answer is yes. Um, uh, but I, again, the needs are different, the, the deployments are different. I mean, it can be done. Actually, one of the things the Open vSwitch guys have done is actually taken P4 to describe the parser in OBS. So there's, there's, there's synergies, there's, you know, uh, there's also complementary stuff going I, on. I would encourage you to look at the light reading report back in December where they compared the VPP performance and the OVS performance and uh, you know there's all kinds of measurements that they have done and very interesting results came out. Uh, to probably uh, VPP uses DPDK as well. Uh, VPP or FDIO uses DPDK as well. So that's that's the IO portion of the of the overall solution. Uh, yeah, under a lot of circumstances. Uh, uh, yes, but that's just the I.O. Then you have to look at uh, actually the forwarding performance, which is very different between OVS and VPP. Uh, maybe I... Just please just look at the light reading report, uh, uh, actually the EANTC report that has been done and published by light reading back in December uh, 2015. Maybe to just extend that question a little bit. So uh, FIDO, yeah, replaces OVS, and uh, OpenSwitch extends OVS and, and it reads through the OVS DB. Uh, so, and of course, P4 and POF have uh, trying to, you know, kind of get rid of it. So why, why is the reason that we are going against or not trying to replace OVS? I mean, of course, the performance, but can you give us more and uh, enlighten us more on that? Uh, on so just to clarify, OpenSwitch doesn't extend OVS. It reuses major components of OVS on the physical switches. Right? So we reuse the OpenFlow agent. We use the OpenVSwitch database. We use many of the infrastructure pieces. But we are not coming to replace, and we are not coming to kind of build on top of it. We are not in the virtual switching at all. Okay. So what are the uh, problems of OVS that uh, the program data plane or the efforts actually address? Can, can so uh, if you would put two prefixes or two MAC addresses into VPP and OVS, uh, it's gonna perform about the same. If you put 20,000, then OVS starts going down. If you put 200,000, that's about, you know, uh, OVS doesn't, cannot really deal with that, and VPP does, deals with no problem. You put two million, VPP can deal with that, OVS cannot. Mm -hmm. So the scale and performance at scale is very, very different with VPP than what it is with OVS. Uh, any qu other questions? Yes. 
So for each of the projects in your perfect world, what would your interface look like to open data? OVSDB protocol for me. I think that's a, a question for the ODL community, but um, some southbound interface that talks to P4 data planes. Um, I think that's still under, you know, research, I guess. Would it be anything other than OpenFlow? It doesn't need to be anything other than OpenFlow. It can be, though. Yeah, yeah I think uh, currently the I think controller uh, still uh, think the device already already programmed. It has already have function in it, and what's this uh, proposal really uh, did is uh, create before the runtime. What happens is you have a box with nothing in it. You need to have the means to program it to uh, give it some fun uh, forwarding functions. Then starting from there, your uh, controller uh, take over the runtime c control and configuration. So I think there's a new things uh, that doesn't exist before. Uh, NetConf, no question about that. Uh, as we have um, shown, uh, actually, OpenDaylight is in FIDO. It's the NetConf agent for VPP. Uh, and uh, we uh, think NetConf is actually a much better protocol than anything else uh, between OpenDaylight and um, uh, the agent uh, on VPP. We have just done some measurements last week, and uh, it performs about 10 times better than OpenFlow, uh, pushing routes or prefixes uh, going down from the controller to a set of switches or a set of NetConf devices. So it's much, much better performant. It has security. It has the flexibility because you can define whatever model you want. OpenDaylight can just suck that model in, generate code on the fly, an application can immediately use whatever model the NetConf device uh, provides. So uh, it, it's by, by no, no means the most performant and the um, uh, most flexible solution for them all. Thank you. So uh, I also had a question emailed to me uh, by Inder Monga, who is the CTO of ESNet. So the question goes, how would carriers, enterprises, or data centers best use the programm programmability in data plane? Can you cite some early use cases that you're targeting? Yeah, I will also mention uh, we are working on a, a project to enhance network visibility. We call that um, dynamic uh, network probes. So basically, it uh, allows the uh, uh, service provider to dynamically install the probes into the network device at any place and, and any time. So then start from there, the user can get a, a track, uh, a tr retrieve data from data plane and uh, then run the, some sort of uh, a big data analytics algorithm to analyze this data and uh, uh, further use, it to use this data to change the network uh, 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 states. So I think this is a, a very important application that uh, all the service providers are looking for. Yeah, I think I, I agree. Yeah, visibility into the network has been a challenge for any networking guy. I've heard of stories where something goes wrong in the network, the uh, compute guy comes with reams and reams of data, and the networking guy comes with like ping and trace route and not much else, right? So visibility into the network is critical, and when you have a programmable data plane, um, you can export data from the data plane to you know, whatever remote uh, monitoring agent and, uh, you know, gather information about the problems. One of the things we've done is um, um, in p4.org that's there is the in-band network telemetry. So it allows you to export metadata from the switches um, in the packets, in the data plane packets, uh, out to any, any remote collector. So it gives you full visibility in the network. And this is one of the things that um, you know, any network can take advantage of with a programmable data plane. And just to complement on the visibility side, um, the way we did it inside OpenSwitch is that we are pushing all the information about of this, the device into the database, and we allow everything to be subscribed about. So for example, you can subscribe to the changes in Mac table, you can subscribe to the changes in LDP, you can subscribe to everything. Right? So the operating system is providing full visibility into the device with everything you want through the same protocol, through OSB protocol, and the controller can fetch completely everything about it. So if you need to build a topology based on LDP, you don't need to forward it to the controller. You can actually ask the switch, hey, whenever LDP information is changing inside your database, tell me. And it will just tell you. 
what happens. So all this visibility should come together in order to provide this uh, complete visibility into the network. Yeah, we're also starting to see a lot of network virtual functions that are being built on this technology and um, things like service function chaining. Um, uh, it, it, it helps a lot. Yeah, so uh, to repeat your question, uh, you're asking about vendor lock-in. If, uh, if they were to have vendor lock-in, how do we? No, more of the target, one of the key targets for these chips to go into server blade farms, let's say, to provide higher performance for the data plane mm -hmm. in an NFT environment. The way we see it mostly today, it's going into top of rack switches. So that's the, that's the first and foremost application that we see right now. Okay. The use cases of them. Any other questions uh, from the audience? Yes. So I guess a lot of some of the things you guys said applies to like a, a node device. So and I'm wondering, I'm wondering in the context, in the context of a, a large scale public cloud platform, uh, does any of the <coughs> So just to re repeat that question for the uh, recording. So it's for a large scale deployment, how do we uh, tackle the problem? Level. At a host level, how do we uh, tackle the problem of programming the data plane? Yeah, well, case. again, with the VPP ODL solution, first of all, VPP uh, for a given um, amount of CPU power, if you will, gets you the best um, uh, available um, forwarding performance. Second, it's a user level process, so it's very easy to deploy. From the open daylight side, uh, again, the scalability of NetConf uh, is much higher than any other southbound. We have just done the measurements last week. You can um, easily attach up to 10, 20,000 devices uh, to a single controller instance. So um, again, I mean, uh, with the, the combination of the uh, high performance programming and a, uh, a protocol, um, a scalable protocol between the, the controller uh, and the devices, uh, you, you, you get the high scale deployment. Okay, so we are almost out of time. So I want to quickly wrap up the whole session so that we have a point to take away from the panel. Uh, so each of you, can you give a, like a short uh, statement on uh, what it is to the ODL community that can take away from programmable data plane? Because if you see Beryllium release, we have a lot of southbound rendering interfaces. But how would the project, the different projects, uh, play a role? Uh, I know FIDO already has Honeycomb Agent, but uh, how, how do we extend that, or how, how do we incorporate it into the next release or future releases? Mike? Okay, so basically, the plumbing and uh, the infrastructure is there. It's going to be about the models for the NVFs and for the new exciting forwarding functions that are going to be provided by VPP-based devices and NVFs. Uh, and uh, uh, the ODL community uh, has all the tools uh, in Open Daylight to actually use those models and start creating some exciting applications. Okay, so... Uh I, uh, as I just said, so the, this uh, programmable data plane uh, brings something totally new to the current data plane, and uh, uh, the uh, ODL need to augment it to to support this uh, by including the programming phase into into its design. Also, at the runtime, if you want to support this interactive interactive programming, which means um, in most cases, current models basically. 
uh, assume the north uh, north side application is actually um, uh, is a, a protocol uh, agnostic, which means it doesn't touch uh, touch the details of the uh, physical uh, physical uh, plane device details. But uh, if you do this uh, programming, you do need to uh, touch on that. So. I think uh, there's some uh, uh, still some difference here. Uh, the I think the ODL architecture need to uh, look at. Yeah, I think I echo the same thoughts. Uh, if you are in the ODL community and you're a developer um, in ODL community, I encourage you to take a look at uh, P4. Um, start coding in P4, and uh, in the future, there might be P4 programmable data planes coming. So it'll be good to figure out how to support these data planes um, uh, in ODL. I mean, through OpenFlow, you can do it already, but uh, as how you were saying, programmable data planes uh, create new paradigms um, for, for networking. So it'll be good for the ODL community to take a look at that. I'll go to the P4 community and encourage them to look at the ODL um, uh, community and stuff um, on the flip side. Thanks. So I'll probably just go over, we'll recycle kind of the previous answers. One is from visibility perspective, demand from the devices and from anyone that you are you're talking to to provide you full visibility into what happens inside it because without it you will not really be able to provide the real value of the controllers and, and the applications on top of you. And second is think about this overlay underlay level because we see it a lot of the underlay being the traditional and overlay being the flexible and see how you can actually accommodate it with inside open daylight community because that's very prevalent use case that we start seeing. Great, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking the panelists for their time. And, and